You're now tuned into the Lady Charmaine Live Show, and I'm your host, Lady Charmaine. And as always, I got another great interview for you today. And in celebration of Women's History Month, as we come to a close, my guest today is a top female Hollywood executive at Viacom CBS. She is the creative force behind the, some of the biggest reality shows like. MTV, The Hills, New Beginnings, Catfish, and VH1's Girl Cruise with Lil' Kim and all her friends. Also, right now, The Juggernaut is airing right now on Paramount+. Plus. If you watched it like I did, it's the real world homecoming, New York airing right now. But I want you to help me welcome none other than the head sister in charge, Miss Satara Pendleton Anglin. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> introduction <laughs> well okay well it is all you you know what I mean it is so well deserved I want to say thank you so much and welcome to the show and I'm just so happy to be able to celebrate you as we end out women's history month so congratulations sister thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. now first off I got to ask you how have you been faring during this pandemic you work in entertainment but how have you been faring through it as we seem to be coming out of it but not so much yeah. Um, I mean, like most working moms, it's a lot, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, ha I, I say this all the time that I think single mothers are, need to be anointed. They need mm -hmm. to be raised on a throne and to mm -hmm. be like hailed beyond because I can't even imagine what that, um, burden is like mm -hmm. to carry by yourself, mm -hmm. you know? So, I, I have no voice to complain about my husband, my job, my kids, <laughs> knowing that there are some sisters that are really holding it down. So I lift them up every day. Like, girl, listen. Right, yeah. right, right. You know, I said the same thing because when the pandemic happened, I'm not a teacher. And I have a seven year old and it takes a lot of yeah. patience, especially trying to get into it. And it's like, OK, then they always need help. And you're in your office and you're trying to work. And I'm like, you know what? All these teachers need a raise. A raise. <laughs> I, I literally, I have cousins that are teachers. And I was like, if there's any time that mm -hmm. your value is appreciated by America, it is right. <laughs> it is right now. Because mm. just the patience or learning the new math. Yes. You know, I can't. I can't. Like, we're going to carry the one and move on. The, can I get a witness? <laughs> <laughs> Say, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> okay. Ain't nobody got time for that. Well, I know. So we were talking about the pandemic and the entertainment industry took a hit. Everybody took a hit. And especially the entertainment industry, people were in production and production came to a halt. How? Yes. How were you affected by that? And what are some of the shows that was affected that you guys were taping during the pandemic? Yeah, no, everything I was working on came to a full stop. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, everything I was working on came to a full stop. And we spent months trying to figure out what was the best way forward to start again. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was a time, if I'm being honest, where I was like, I am probably the most overpriced television executive right now to sit at home, not doing what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and where we ended up being able to amazingly quickly pivot was we had to quickly figure out how do we do what we do, but in this new world order, right? Mm -hmm, how do mm -hmm. we in COVID safely begin shooting again, getting our cast working again, they're all in contracts. If they're not working, they're not making money. Like, so it wasn't just about, you know, me and, and the producers or anyone else that's working on the show. It's also the people who we feature in front of the camera as well. And we were able to get up um, a couple of um, bubble shows, we called them, where we basically put cast and crew in a hub. Mm. We bought out a resort. We shot multiple shows under that, um, very safe uh, COVID uh, quarantine environment. Um, another show that I do um, is Catfish. We took Catfish completely virtual. So instead mm -hmm. of them doing investigations around the country, like they did, you know, Catfish investigations the way that we're all living life right now, which is on Zoom. So right. um, we were able to at least get something up and going, but I'm happy to say we're now finally returning and resuming to being in full production. So that's what you call them bubble shows. I was watching a, um, another show on VH1, <laughs> another show. And I'm, you know, they were shooting at a mansion. So that's what just get everybody there and just make sure everybody is tested. And yeah. this is where we're so going to be shooting. Just test for a number of days leading up to mm -hmm. test before you get to the bubble 
quarantine within that time. And then once we know that everyone is safe and tested and on the other side of a quarantine, then yeah, as long and we, they can't leave. Can't leave the bubble. Okay, so now you are one of those head sisters in charge, and I got to say a black sister because it's so good to see sisters in entertainment at the top of their game and in their career. So, of course, I'm so excited to talk to you in just a little bit. Okay, everybody, she's married to a high school friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I went to high school with her husband, but, <laughs> but it is so good just to see you literally at the top of your game. And before you got there, I want to go a little bit and talk about your career because a lot of people have aspirations to be where you are today. So, um, you and I, we've talked offline even before, but was entertainment always an area that you wanted to go in that you saw yourself? And if it was, what capacity did you see yourself in the beginning? Yeah. Um, so the short answer is yes. I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. Um, but in my infancy, if you will, of this business, I didn't know enough about it to know really where I would probably land. So in the beginning, it was, you know, growing up in New York City, uh, there was a sister who did the five o'clock news that I would watch every day. Her name was Rhonda Watts, which later became a talk show host and some mm -hmm. other stuff. Rolanda was on ABC News, honey. I just wanted to be Rolanda Watts. That that was my goal at the time. <laughs> okay, I don't want to be in front of the camera. That was never my thing. But how do I help Rolanda be dope on TV, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point, I realized that news wasn't, was too restrictive for the type of storytelling that I wanted to do. Like, I didn't care about, you know, what happened uh, at, with the fire down the street or things mm -hmm. like that. I wanted to tell real stories about real people, more human interest stuff. So as I developed through college and, you know, even back to high school, honestly, and taking courses and studying television, television production in college, um, my world and what I knew about the opportunities within this business began to grow. And then, you know, I have to say, you know, in order to get to a certain level, like you got to have a bit of an ego. Mm -hmm. So at first I thought I wanted to be a director until I realized that somebody told the director what to do. Even then I was like, oh, that's called a producer. Okay, well, I want to be a producer now because I need to be in charge. And I realized, <laughs> no, if there's another producer above that producer that tells that producer what to do, I'm like, well, then I need to be her. So my, you know, my skill set. So I just kept like figuring out what, where the things, how I'm built, and the things that are of interest to me um, could be best utilized. But then mm -hmm. also, like, just gotta understand what your what your superpowers are, right? What are the things that you're really good at? My husband teases me all the time that I'm a planner. Like I'm always thinking ahead. I'm always like, but if you do this and this happens, da, da, da. so that is a perfect superpower for my job. Mm -hmm. Right now I have 16 shows on the Viacom CBS brand that I'm responsible for. So they're all at various stages of production from the beginning stage to either shooting to even being editing or on the air. So it is my job to constantly figure out that the matrix of that mm. and just who I am, how I'm built that happens to be one of the superpowers I can bring to my job. Okay, so since you have some superpowers, I want to talk about <laughs> everybody got their first big break. You know, when they talk about what was your big break? What was your big break when you got your foot in that door and you was like, okay, this is all I need. What was that break? Yes. Um, my first big break came when I actually got fired <laughs> from a job. Um, <laughs> I... Um, was in college and I was hustling, trying to do anything I could to be in this business. I was constantly working for free or volunteering mm -hmm. to work on productions and stalking hiring managers at various networks. And at one time, this um, hiring manager hired me and he said, look, you'll be at the network, but you won't be in production. You'll be in marketing. I'm like, marketing? Doesn't matter. I'll take it. Took the job. It was terrible as apparently as a marketing assistant. So I spent more time talking to the production people. <laughs> actually doing my marketing job um, and they fired me or wanted mm. to fire me. Um, unbeknownst to me, my name and reputation had started to make its way around the building. My passion for what I wanted to do all the time that I would spend after hours, like coming and volunteering and helping with productions and so forth, that the COO of that network called me to his office. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, this man thinks that I've embezzled from the company. Like I'm a lowly, like, you know, <laughs> One year old kid, like, what, how does he even know my name? And um, after not saying much, interviewing me and getting to know me, he asked me to cover his assistant's desk for two weeks. On the other side of covering his assistant's desk for two weeks, which was kind of like, 
okay, I'll just, he didn't say anything. He was like, I want you to sit there, kill it. We'll talk in two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, he said to me, I'm going to hand you your first job in this business. Mm. He goes, the people upstairs want to hire someone else, but I've been watching you and people are talking about you and I think you have something. So he literally handed me my first job after being fired and told me to go up, go up, he was like, go upstairs and, and, and make me proud. And he was right in the sense that, you know, forgive me, this, a, a white woman wanted someone else. She, mm-hmm. she was like, wait, I don't understand. how are they just going to this black girl this mm-hmm. job? That's what mm-hmm. works for people like her. Um, and she's not wrong. It, and he happened to be a black man who like saw something in me. And um, she hated me, did not talk to me for <laughs> two weeks, um, wow. made my life hell. And I turned that around. I just, I turned it around. I mean, till this day, this is now, I'm going to date myself, but it's 20 some odd years ago. <laughs> she found me on LinkedIn and like called to just say like, I think you're amazing. And like, you know, do you know an entertainment attorney that I can look for in LA? Like now she's coming to keep her stuff. And like, I thank her for that experience because while she made it hard in the beginning, mm-hmm. it showed me like, if you really want it, like, girl, it don't matter who's for you. If, That's right. if God is for you, it don't matter who's against you. Amen. No, it doesn't matter. You just got to own yours. And I just, I needed to make him proud to pr- prove that he wasn't wrong about me, but also this was it. This mm-hmm. was that moment. And it was an assistant, but it was an assistant at a studio. She worked in production. Like that, that was it. That's all I needed. And that was my big break. Do you still keep in contact with him? I do. Ironically, he posted oh. something, speaking of LinkedIn, he posted something on LinkedIn and um, I saw his name come up and I just like put a little heart and I was like, I really hope that you're well. And he wrote the loveliest note because obviously for my career, I'm mm-hmm. posting stuff on LinkedIn about the things that I'm doing. And he's like, I'm really proud of you. Like you, you did it. Like I, I, I have been watching you for years and I'm so proud of you. And that alone, I mean, he's retired now. Like, please. I felt like he was old when I was a kid. So <laughs> like, I, I will forever be grateful for that opportunity of just seeing something. Back then. See, that's, that's a blessing. It was so funny. Cause um, I studied radio and a television when I was in college and we had did a reunion a couple months ago, which was really fun. So if anybody going to be watching, Hey y'all, we did um, a reunion and a friend of mine works at a news station in Texas. And we were all just talking about our careers and what people are doing now because we hadn't seen each other in like years. Um, for me, it's like almost 30. <laughs> so it's been a long time. <laughs> so, but, but it's been a long time, but it was so nice. One of our friends who um, is a, a morning news anchor, in Texas. And he was just talking about, you know, his first big break and who gave him his break. And one of our um, directors was also in the call. So we were all able to talk. So he brought up this gentleman's name, not knowing that our director was actually sitting with him. And he was the head of um, a a major uh, corporation. And, but it was so nice that he was actually able to say thank you to him after all these years. We had no idea that he was even in the room. Um, Our friend, that's his best friend. So they would just have a lunch together. Okay. Well, go figure, right? But it was so nice to be able to give that opportunity. So that's why I was just asking if you still yeah. talk to them where they could see where you are and what you're doing and just be proud. His name is Mel Ming, and I will forever be grateful for Mr. Mel Ming for taking a shot on a little black girl from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> see, what, what, what a blessing. And so for you, uh, we know that you guys have shows that come to um, Viacom all the time. And then once the show is picked up, then what is your role? <sighs> um, a lot of things. Um, my <laughs> the, the macro of my role is that I am the creative. Um, I'm responsible for the creative oversight of the show. Mm-hmm. I also need to make sure that it comes in on time and on budget. So um, by the time a show comes to me after it's been pitched to the network mm-hmm. and they're like, great, this is something we want to do. They hand it to me and I need to fulfill the episode order. A lot of times it's like, you know, 10 or 20 episodes. And um, then there's a budget that's attached to it. So we have production companies that are the, you know, the people that are like really in the sauce working mm-hmm. on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and my job is to like, no, 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 not this way, this way. No, 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 let's change this. I don't like that. Let's adjust this. But constantly keeping a vision and, and helping to elevate whatever it's going to be, that it's on brand, that it's on target and that it's on budget. Um, and often, you know, 
as most creatives, like, you know, you'll take someone who's, you know, uh, um, an author. Well, mm-hmm. an author has an editor, right? Like sometimes you're so close to mm-hmm. um, your material that you become, we call it um, production blind or set blind. And you're like, this is the best scene ever. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> and then someone like me comes in and watches them. We're like, okay, I see where you're going. I see the vision, but here's the things that we need to do to tweak it. Mm-hmm. Or you're trying to communicate this to your audience, but what it's really saying is this. Mm-hmm. So here are the roadmaps or the things that we need to do to kind of steer it towards that direction. So that is my job. My job is to not be very micro in the process, but to then have them get my teams get to a point where then I step in and go, this is amazing, great. Or like, no, here are the ships, here are the things, here are the other global things that we need to think about from a marketing perspective, Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. here's how we might get in trouble legally or what have you, but to be the, um, the, the person in charge of all of those things coming together from legal marketing, uh, ad sales, like mm-hmm. just all of the sauce that continues to be the show. So do you give the show the green light? I don't. My boss gives the green light. My boss ultimately decides what goes on. It is my job to prove the green right. The green light right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to get it ready <laughs> for the green light. Yeah, so for instance, even some of the bubble shows that we did, like, mm-hmm. um, there were two ideas that were internally um, pitched by my group, right? So we didn't return that to the development team. My boss came to us and said, we have all this talent, we have all this crew, what can we do? So my mm-hmm. team and I came up with two ideas. Well, we came up with a few ideas. We pitched them up to her. She ultimately said, I like this one and this one. What can you do with it? Well, this was white paper five minutes ago. So mm-hmm. now we're like, okay, well, now we have to make the show. And a lot of times you have an idea, it's on white paper, you start getting into the mechanics of making the show to realize, I sounded really good on paper, but it's not. <laughs> you know? um, or, you know, my favorite thing is when people exceed your expectations, mm. right? Like, I could interview you, get an idea of where you are, what your story is, and so forth, and then say, okay, well, we're going to follow her on this journey. And mm. then there's a curveball in your life, or you might do something unexpected, or I learned something new about you through this process that I hadn't seen before, that is far more interesting than something that I put on paper. Right. To me, that's what I love when we can say, screw the paper for a moment. This is a real person with real things going on. And this story is going to be messy. It's not messy in the sense of like, it's not a perfectly arced story, mm-hmm. right? Because we're not perfectly arced human beings. We right. might go here and there. So it may not fit a scripted model of how a story should be told, but it's probably going to be far more interesting than anything we ever could have thought of because it's this human connection that we're following that will make our viewers want to see that or want to be a part of that journey or follow your ebbs and flows as it happens. To me, that that's the beauty of, of storytelling. And, you know, that's why I knew I couldn't do news. I mean, it needed, it needed <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? Now, with you being a creative and I'm listening to you as you're talking about television and how everything that should go into it. Do you ever watch a show and it's like nails on a chalkboard because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, are you real judgmental when it comes to the shows and real critical? <laughs> I'm the worst. Like my husband's like, he does not want to watch TV with me. I <laughs> we what we're separate viewers because there are things that he'll watch and I'm like, really? But what about, didn't you see the continuity's off? What right. Mm-hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Like I, mm, it's probably like a musician listening to bad music. I mean, right. a musician. Mm-hmm. And there were things that he'd be like, I, like I, can't, I can't, no, she can't sing. Like she's <laughs> off key. Like it would be like nails in a truck. Right. I, I'm very, I'm, yeah, I'm the worst. Yeah, I'm the worst. And I totally get it. Cause I'm like that. It's like when the continuity's off, her, she had bangs. Did you see that, honey? She had bangs right there, but she don't have bangs right here. Her hair was curly here, now it's straight here. <laughs> Stuff like that just annoys me. It just really does. The person is different in the background. I guess I just see things differently, hear things differently. And I'm not even a TV producer. It's just some things that I just look out for. So I was wondering if you were if you were like that. So um, do you have any advice for, say, like a young black woman who desires to work in the industry, entertainment industry? And she said, you know, I want to be a senior vice president like you one day. I admire you and you're the person that I look to as a mentor. What advice would you give her? Take every job. Take every job. Like you might think you know what it is you want to do, but Mm -hmm. honestly, until you're doing it and in it, you don't know. Um, 
but also there's so much learning. Like even in all the little jobs that I took getting to where I am now, no, I was never going to be a sound mixer. No, I didn't care about working in the wardrobe department or any of the other things that I did. But the knowledge that I gained from having insight into what it took to do that job, Mm. all of those things allowed me to get to where I am now. So, you know, this is not to take anything away from anyone whose path to where I sit was different. Mm -hmm. But what I love about the path is that I came from production. I, you know, remember like sleeping in an edit bay because like I had to finish a show and there was just no time to go home and change. Mm. Or I had a live show the next day and I never went home the night before and I'm in the studio first thing in the morning handing out like fresh copies of like you know whatever the rundown was because in my office all night figuring all of those things out like I remember those days I have that experience mm-hmm. so now being over this there's implied knowledge that I have that ultimately helps my team right, right. but you also can't blow wind across my as well like oh no that's not possible is it though? Yeah, it mm. is. Because if you move the camera over there, and if you do this, and da 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 da, you know those things. Like I love when I walk in a set, and I typically don't. I don't announce myself. I don't say who I am. Half the crew won't know who I am, and I don't like walk in like oh, I'm. Hey, I'm the boss. I walk. <laughs> I just quietly observe, and I can tell you within three seconds. Like okay, well, I don't know why that shot is set up that way because it's not going to work or this will work, but I know these things because I was mm-hmm. part of that process. Right. So everything along the way, even me, things that I thought, oh yeah, no, I want to do this. Once I was doing that job, I was like, mm-hmm. but now I can take pieces of that and mm-hmm. help me inform what the next step was for me. And you build your name and your reputation along the way. People get to know you. This business truly is about who you know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Everything. Everything. Absolutely. You know, people say it's not, well, it's not, um, it's not, um, it, it's, it's about what you know, but in entertainment, like you said, it's not what you know, it's who you know and it's who knows you. Because you know. <laughs> people, it's like you said, in not knowing anyone. Mm-hmm. I say to interns and assistants right now, like, don't just come into this job thinking that you need to meet all the rest of us. Like, you're mm-hmm. only interested in the people who are above you versus the people who took our. Mm-hmm. who are to your left and right. Because now the people who are to my left and right were to my left and right when I was in a different position. Mm-hmm. But that networking starts there. You start building your network at your own level, your own foundation. My old assistant was looking for a job. She was ready for a, a next move. How did she get that job? Another assistant who previously left her job was at another job and said, girl, look. And they recommended her over there. Again, mm-hmm. it's, it's the network. So it's not just here, it's here. You know, um, for those of you that are watching, everything she's saying is true. And I, only reason why I could say that, I remember when I was 15 years old and I'm a person, I know no strangers. I love talking to everybody. I'm just friendly. And I, I would never forget, I was on my very first movie set and I was just there as an extra, just happy to be on the set, to be working on a movie. I actually auditioned for the role, did not get the role. They gave the role to somebody else. But they said, would you be willing to be an extra? Absolutely. As long as I'm in the building, this girl is good. I'm there. I mean, I was friends with everybody from wardrobe to um, the the catering truck that was there. I guess food craft service is what they call it. And then there was these uh, two men that was on set. People used to always talk about them and call them grungy and dirty because they was a part of a motorcycle club. But I would come in every day and I would just say hello to everybody. And that's just something that I did. I never forget that day when those two grungy people that all the kids was talking about, they came to me and I was always the first girl on the set, mind you. I was the first girl on the set. I was 15. You know, I was able to get out of school and everything. I got all that stuff done, but I was the first girl on the set. And um, I never forget that morning. I was just sitting there just waiting. And I never forget those two dudes came and dropped a script in front of me. And they just said, I want you to say these words. I knew immediately that it was, it was lines, but I had no idea. It was the very lines that I auditioned for that I didn't get. That girl who had the lines originally was cast for it. She did something. And so she didn't have that, those lines anymore, but they gave it to me. But just because I spoke to them every day, every day, I talked to them every day. I was always on set before time. I was always the first person there with my brother. I would get there sometimes at 6 a.m. When they got there, you're going to see this face. 
And that's how I actually ended up getting my very first agent. Didn't know this lady. She used to bug me every day, just staring at me, but I didn't know who she was. But I would always say hi to her and I would get annoyed because she would just sit there among all, because sometimes it'd be like 300 kids in there. But she would stare at me every day. Then one day she came up to me and gave me her card and she said, I would like to be your agent. I've been watching you because I was on the set for three months. She said, I've been watching you all this time. And that's how I got my first agent. So like you, it's, it's who you know and be friendly with everybody because you don't know who's who. You don't know. I was yeah. fired. Didn't know people were watching me. Correct. You don't know. And so that, and that's the one thing I learned. And um, I think Louis Gossett Jr., I see you, if, you, if you're going to ever see this, has something to do with it. Because when I ran to him to let him know I got those lines, he said, oh, yeah, I know. And I'm like, I, I just found out. So I'm like, how did you know? <laughs> so you never know who's watching you. Mm -hmm. So I just had to share that story. And so... We were talking about the real world um, homecoming New York. It just yes. got a reboot on Paramount. Tell us a little bit about that and why did you decide, why did you decide to bring it back? Um, well, everything is old is new again. Um, mm -hmm. We were approaching the 30th anniversary of the um, original season of the real world. And um, it just seemed like the perfect time to bring that cast together. What was so crazy is that cast, when that show came out in 1992, <laughs> um, I was in college. And I was at that point in college where I was still kind of figuring out like what my major was, right? I'd done mm -hmm. all my core curriculum and it was like, it was either going to be TV or film, TV or film. And watching that show, and I said, I've already decided not to do news, right? Watching that show helped me realize like, oh, wait, I don't have to do news. I can actually still tell real stories about real people who mm -hmm. do something like that. Mm. And watching them, being mad that I was now in college in Maryland and they were in my hometown <laughs> filming this show and they were all my age. Like, I, I, was, I watched every episode. I couldn't gobble it up soon enough. So when um, the powers that be, at, you know, my boss came and said, hey, I, I, we want you to head up their, you know, the return of the real world. And I was like, okay. And she's like, with the original cast. I'm sorry, say what? Like the cat, the original seven from 1992? Yeah, we want to get them back together again and have fresh conversations 30 years later. And that was, again, one of those shows that we shot in a bubble. You know, we quarantined them, tested, blah, 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 put them in the loft for, you know, six intensive days of filming. And um, I'd say that that series is probably one of the best things I've done in my career in a long time. A wow. Long time. It's fantastic. Please, if you have not seen it, you owe it to yourself. Please, Paramount Plus, go and binge that. It is, it is amazing. And as a Black woman, what is most amazing, sad, enlightening, but amazing all at the same time is when that was happening in 1992, it was 30 years after the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. right? So from the 60s to the 90s. And when they were shooting the original, original um, Real World New York, it was Rodney King and um, mm -hmm. Anita Baker, Anita Baker, geez, and Anita Hill <laughs> and uh, I mean, the black girl, right? <laughs> it, um, it, it was that time. So now, 30 years later, it's not Rodney King, it's George Floyd. Yeah. You know? So the sad part is, is as much of things have changed, have changed, they've remained the same. Right. But the types of conversations, the real conversations that they had on that show 30 years ago, and then the ones that we replicated again 30 years later are still some that like no other reality show or having. Yes, we can all have fun and watch Housewives. Mm -hmm. and I watch the Housewives like mm -hmm. I'm in. Um, but this this was on some like, whoa, like, let, let's really get into it. Have fun. Have right. a trip down the lane. Have some nostalgia. But like it was really fascinating to watch. Well, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. I thank you so much. I want to remind everybody to make sure that you tune in to the real world homecoming New York on Paramount Plus. So you guys make sure you binge watch that. OK, also make sure you watch all the other MTV shows, CBS, VH1, Viacom owns everything. OK, <laughs> okay. let's just say all the Viacom shows. <laughs> what don't they own? OK, <laughs> CMT, Nickelodeon. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much. So all of us have watched a uh, Viacom television show or two or three. But I want to say again to my very special guest, Satara Pendleton England. Thank you so much. As we round out our Women's History Month, I am so 
proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. It was wonderful. You're welcome.